there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. This is episode number 60 of Left Side of the Aisle. It's for the week of June 7th through 13th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. As always, comments, questions, reactions, plaudits, brickbats, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And um, if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed around here somewhere a couple of times during the show, and you can get the email address from there. I do answer my email. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. The only thing I ask is that if you do send me email, please, in the subject line, be sure to include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something so that I know it's not spam. All right, today I got a whole bunch of things I want to get through. got about a half a dozen things maybe I want to try to get through today. Some of which I have to tell you in advance, um, I find really, really infuriating. Some of these things got me really so angry that I don't know how calm I can be and talking about them. I mean, I know I get intense sometimes, but by and large, I try to let the facts do the work for me. Um, but some of these, I just know I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, in fact, I'll start with one. I'll start with one. Uh, you think you got free speech? Think again. You basically have the ability to uh, criticize your betters uh, to the degree that the, those betters in government choose to allow you to. In 2006, the big Dick Cheney was visiting a mall in Colorado, and there was this guy, his name was Stephen Howards. He saw him there, got in the line to meet Cheney. When he got up to him, said to Cheney, your policies in Iraq are disgusting. And as Cheney started to move down the line, apparently Howard's touched him on the shoulder, and then he turned and he walked away. Well, a Secret Service agent named Gus Reichel followed Howard's, accosted him, got into an argument with him, and then arrested him for assaulting Cheney. The charges were dropped almost immediately, and Howard's sued uh, Reichel and another uh, uh, Secret Service officer um, on the grounds that they violated his free speech with a retaliatory arrest. That is, in effect, they violated his right to free speech because he said they arrested him because he gave Cheney grief. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit agreed with Howard's. However, on Monday, June 4th, the Supreme Court of the United States, Supreme Court of the United States, um, unanimously, which means it includes all those liberals who are so vital to have on the court, the court unanimously overturned that decision, letting these agents just walk without consequence. Now, Justice Clara Bell Thomas, writing for the court, uh, he rejected Howard's argument that the general right to be free from retaliation for one's speech uh, uh, made what officers did unconstitutional, thereby opening up to liability. The court rejected this argument. The justices instead held that the agents were entitled to immunity because no federal court had clearly established the specific right to be free from a retaliatory arrest that is otherwise supported by probable cause. Let me disentangle that. The court found that no federal court had previously specifically said that coming up with some way, some justification to arrest somebody does not automatically exempt you from any constitutional claim about violation of rights. Because no court had said that, uh, these uh, Secret Service agencies, uh, agents could not be expected to know that arresting Howard for retaliation as retaliation for criticizing the big Dick Cheney was actually a violation of his rights. They couldn't be expected to know this. That's what the Supreme Court says about free speech. Now, the thing is, there are three more things about this case. Um, Reichel's lawyer, a guy named Sean Gallagher, raised the issue of free speech zones. Uh, this is where that uh, the idea that um, the, the Secret Service can establish, if you will, a bubble around the people they're protecting 
um, sometimes these bubbles have been known to be like as big as a city block, and saying that within that zone, which, which the Secret Service sets on its own judgment, within that zone, free speech does not exist. And in fact, people have been arrested simply for holding a sign along a route where a president was going, where the Secret Service said, no, you just can't do that. So Gallagher brought up this thing about free speech zones, and there's no indication in any news account that that raised a single eyebrow anywhere in that courtroom. So apparently this idea that the Secret Service can just wipe away the Constitution within whatever limits they set around some important member of government we're just supposed to take this for granted now. This is just ordinary, routine, not even worth remarking on, that the Secret Service can just say the, the Constitution doesn't exist here. Here's the second thing about this. Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer issued a concurring opinion. Um, they said that Secret Service agents are required to, I'm quoting them here, make singularly swift, on-the-spot decisions whether the safety of the person they are protecting is in jeopardy. What swift decision are they talking about? Reichel followed Howards, accosted him, got into an argument with him, and then arrested him. What snap decision are they talking about here? This is nonsense. And the other thing that gets me about this is that the Secret Service, they have a valuable and important job, okay, they do. Um, they're prepared, these, these people are prepared to jump in front of an official they are guarding and take the bullet in the chest in order to protect. They're willing to throw their body on top of this other person in order to protect them from the bomb blast. They're prepared to do this at an instant's notice. But apparently, the thought of possibly being sued for something is now a completely paralyzing fear. But here's the worst part of this. Here's the worst part of this. Principal Deputy Solicitor General Sri Srinivasan, if I'm pronouncing his name right, now, this, uh, the, the, the Solicitor General is the one who argues before the Supreme Court on behalf of the executive branch. He's there on behalf of Barack Obama. He was arguing on behalf of the Obama's administration in support of the agents, not surprisingly. He told the justices that it also makes sense to apply officer immunity in other situations. You see, there had been an argument. Uh, some of the justices were a little worried that this idea of exempting the Secret Service from any, uh, or granting them rather, immunity from any possible suit for retaliatory arrest. I said, well, what about other police? What about everybody else? And now Gallagher said he was looking for a very narrow decision, applying only to the Secret Service. But the Deputy Solicitor General, speaking on behalf of the Obama administration, said no, it should apply everywhere. Every cop, from federal cops all the way down to the street cop, should be immune from suits for retaliatory arrests as long as they can come up with some excuse for having arrested somebody. And if you wonder about that, if you're in good terms with a cop, ask them. If you really tried, if you wanted to, could you find some reason that you could at least make sound plausible for arresting somebody? They'll tell you yes. So actually what the, what, the, what the Obama administration is saying is that every cop in the country should be able to arrest you in retaliation for something you did and walk. All right, we're going on now to um, a, new, a new feature. It'll be an occasional feature here like some of our others, but this is the What a Clown Award. Um, and our first, our first winner here is uh, the state of North Carolina. Recently, the North Carolina Coastal Resources Commission predicted a one meter, it's about a 39 inch rise in sea level uh, by the year 2100. That would put about 2,000 square miles of, of uh, North Carolina's low coastal land at risk of being flooded. Well, faced with this news, and prompted by developers who want to develop shorefront property, state lawmakers swung into action. First, they forced the commission to delete the reference to a one-meter rise from its report. And Republican legislators are now circulating a bill 
uh, that states that sea level rise rates, I'm quoting here, shall only be determined using historical data, and these data shall be limited to the time period following the year 1900. Rates of sea level rise may be extrapolate, extrapolated linearly. In other, words, in other words, they want planners to be required to predict sea level rise based on a straight line increase, even though every bit of research, every prediction, every model predicts an, an accelerating rate of rise. The thing is, using a straight line prediction, sea levels around North Carolina will only rise 8 inches by 2100. Now, the Colbert Report actually mentioned this on Monday. And he said, Stephen Colbert said, it was simple. If your science gives you a result you don't like, pass a law saying the result is illegal. Problem solved. Uh, now this, this, really is, this is really like North Carolina would be like ordering the Atlantic Ocean to not rise more than eight inches. Unfortunately for them, the real numbers don't allow for this, and they're scarier. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere in the Arctic have reached over 400 parts per million, with 350 parts per million considered by scientists the maximum safe level. Carbon dioxide levels have not been over 400 parts per million for over 800,000 years. Now, a number of states have realized the implication of this. Maine is planning for a rise of up to two meters by 2100. Delaware, a meter and a half. Uh, Louisiana, one meter. Uh, California, 1.4 meters. Southeastern Florida is projecting a rise of two feet by 2060. That is in the next 50 years. But not North Carolina. Oh, no, no, no. There, Tom Thompson, director of a group of local legislators who were opposed to planning for sea level rises, said of the Coastal Resources Commission, I'm not saying these people are liars. I'm saying they have a passion for sea level rise and they just can't give it up. In other words, he's saying, oh, they're not liars. They're just wild-eyed fanatics. Like well, it used for you, Mr. Thompson, what they are is researchers looking at the science and what you are is a clown. And uh, now there's um, something else. Now, I, I've been talking about the loss of the commons. I've mentioned this a couple of weeks in a row now. The, the attack on the idea that we are a community with mutual responsibilities. Here's a, here's a perfect example of this Louisiana is embarking on a plan to privatize public education. In fact, I, I specifically raised this, I guess it was last week, uh, that, you know, education is, no, public education, no, no, no. That implies you have a responsibility for all the members of the public, poor, rich, whatever, to have an adequate education. Oh, no, no, we're going to privatize that. Uh, the state is preparing to ship tens of millions of dollars in tax money out of the public schools to pay private industry, business owners, and even church pastors to educate children. Um, starting this fall, thousands of, of uh, middle class kids are going to get vouchers to cover the full cost of tuition at some 120 private schools across Louisiana. Some of these are small Bible-based church schools. Now supposedly all of these schools have been vetted have been vetted by the state of Louisiana in order to be approved for these vouchers. The thing is, some of them, some of these schools, these approved schools, are using social studies texts that warn that liberals are threatening global prosperity. Some of them are using Bible-based math books that don't even talk about modern concepts like set theory and apparently are supposed to have you calculate your answers in cubits. And some of them are using biology texts that are built around rejecting evolution. This is what the state of Louisiana is approving as education to be paid for with tax money. Now the year after that, 2013, students at any income level will be eligible for what they call mini-vouchers that they can use for uh, private sector vendors for, for classes or for apprenticeships, whatever. The money can go to trade groups, to businesses, to uh, um, online schools, to tutors, to lots of other places. And the thing is, every time a student receives one of these vouchers, their school loses the same amount of money in public funds. 
This is a conscious plan to undermine public education. This is a conscious plan to do away with public education and turn education into just another profit center for private business, where the quality of an education that you get ultimately will wind up depending upon how rich you are and in how exclusive a school you can get into. Now, on something else, again, related to the commons, last week we talked about Florida. I said Florida was looking to purge as many as 239,000 voters from its rolls. The local officials in Florida, both Democrat and Republican, were resisting doing this because they said the data from the state is it's no good. It's lousy data. And interestingly, as I pointed out last week, just as happened in the infamous purge in the year 2000, many of these supposedly ineligible voters turn out, by pure coincidence of course, to be people who'd be more likely to vote for Democrats than for Republicans. In 2000 it was blacks, this year it's Latinos. Now the Department of Justice sent a letter last week to Florida state officials saying this purge appeared to violate the Voting Rights Act and the National Voter Registration Act. In response, all 67 county election supervisors said that they were stopping the purge. However, now the Florida state officials have ordered them to renew it. They say they're going to ignore this and continue the purge because, they say, having one ineligible voter on the rolls is just too many. We can't accept that. While at the same time saying, apparently, that picking thousands of eligible voters off the rolls is not a problem. All right, we're actually going to take a break. Okay, we're back now and uh, for our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. And I got to tell you, this is another one that has me, this has me really, really angry, really, really furious about this. In the news just the, just the other day, it says that we killed the number two person in Al-Qaeda. How many number twos have we killed so far? I mean, it's, you know, I, I have no idea, but it just seems we're constantly killing the number two person in Al-Qaeda. I mean, how many number twos do they have? It's a very weird numbering system. Um, and, and the U.S. official said this is a major blow to the battered core leadership of Al-Qaeda. And how many major blows to the battered core leadership have we seen? I mean, this gets ridiculous. It's just, you know, it, it becomes like reading 1984. You know, in 1984, you were constantly at war. There was always a threat. You were constantly at war. And yet somehow you were always winning. So you didn't get discouraged. I said, hold on a little bit longer. We're going to win this war. Um, but you never did. It's starting to feel like that. We're always winning, but we never win. These, uh, this person was killed with a CIA drone strike. Um, his name is actually Abu Yahya Alibi. Um, and they actually targeted him three times, three separate drone strikes over three days. They got him on the third time. They said the strikes not only killed him, it destroyed a house and a vehicle. There was actually no news about the destruction or death from the previous two failed attempts to get this guy. But this attack was part of a surge in predator drone strikes in Pakistan in recent weeks. And these strikes have been causing more and more problems for relations between U.S. and Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan's government has condemned the use, uh, the CIA's use of these predator drones, uh, killed civilians, and they say, the Pakistan government says that these deaths of civilians are a recruiting agent uh, for, for insurgents, for al-Qaeda, for militants. Um, the foreign ministry of Pakistan said this attack represented a clear red line for Pakistan. The U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, I'm quoting here, was informed that the drone strikes are unlawful against international law and a violation of Pakistan's sovereignty. And parliament had, had emphatically stated that they were unacceptable. We don't care. We don't. We don't, we don't care. We don't care about international law, Pakistan's sovereignty. We don't care about any of that. We're like Lily Tomlin's phone operator talking about the telephone company. You know, we're the phone company. We don't have to care. We're the U.S. 
We don't have to care what Pakistan thinks. But that is not why this is the outrage of the week. This is. News accounts about this and other similar incidents keep referring to militants have been killed. In fact, the White House insists that civilian casualties are in the single digits total. The thing is, U.S. media outlets reporting these accounts have absolutely no idea about who was killed in these strikes. All they know is that officials, uh, usually American, sometimes Pakistani, but um, officials have told them they were militants, and they simply report that as fact. They report this not only without having the slightest idea who these people actually were or whether or not the, these accounts of their own militants is true, but they do it in the face of reports from respected international agencies like Reuters, like AP, like the BBC, and so on. These, these reliable reports of civilian deaths in Pakistan. And worse, they do it with the full knowledge that the White House is deliberately distorting and twisting the word militant for its own propaganda purposes. Barack Obama has embraced a disputed method, I love that, disputed method for counting civilian casualties. In effect, says that all, all uh, military-age males in an area are militants. Um, and they, they do this, they're all combatants, and so all legal targets, not civilians, unless, they said, there is explicit intelligence posthumously proving them innocent. Well, first, I'm sure that the CIA and the, US, uh, and the rest of the U.S. intelligence is going to a lot of trouble after these people are dead to find out if they were actually civilians or not. And I'm sure that they, that their families and the dead themselves, would be very, very pleased to know that after they're dead, it's, oh, actually, they were innocent. I'm sure they're very, very grateful for that. Counterterrorism officials insist that this method of counting everybody, every male as a militant, is one of simple logic. Uh, people who are in an area of known terrorist activity or anywhere near a top Qaeda uh, operative, they're probably up to no good. So I tell you what, why don't we go up to Mattapan? Why don't we go to the South Bronx down in New York and just arrest and imprison one, everyone in the neighborhood? Because arrest them all because you're living in an area of known criminal activity. So you obviously must all be criminals. It's simple logic. This kind of lie, this kind of deceit, this kind of, this is the outrage of the week. There, I, have to, I have to have some good news from there. I have to have some good news from there. So first I'm going to tell you about a, a small but um, important victory. On Tuesday, June 5th, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals declined to reconsider a three-judge uh, panel's earlier decision that California's infamous Proposition 8, or Prop 8 as it came to be called, uh, violated the U.S. Constitution's guarantee of equal treatment under the law because what this proposition did is it took away a right that had already been established. California Supreme Court had ruled that the ban on same-sex marriage violated the state's constitution, So, and then this took away a right, and so it said that was a violation of the constitution. The case will now go to the Supreme Court, which is expected to rule like in about a year from now. Also on this, a not small but important victory. Just over a week ago, the First Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that part of the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional. Specifically, that part that denies federal benefits to same-sex couples who are legally married in their home state. Uh, this is the section of law that the Obama administration um, previously said that it would not defend in court because it was unconstitutional. And to its credit, they kept their word. Uh, credit where it's due, they did not defend this. The First Circuit is the first federal appeals court to rule on this issue with the Defense of Marriage Act, and they found it unconstitutional. 
Now, the Supreme Court has re- has historically been reluctant to get too far ahead of public opinion on matters. But in this case, it wouldn't be. Because support for same-sex marriage is growing steadily. A lot of polls now are showing even majorities in favor of same-sex marriage, at least pluralities. In fact, it's getting hard to find a poll where a plurality is against same-sex marriage. And just remember, when the high court struck down a ban on interracial marriage, this was in 1967, this is within my adult life, that we actually finally put an end to uh, bans on interracial marriage. At that point, according to public opinion polls, a majority of Americans still opposed mixed-race marriages. But times are changing. And if you really want an example, just check out this cartoon. Check out this cartoon. You want to know the secret? All right, what this is, you can't quite see it clearly. What it is, it is a cartoon of a same-sex, mixed-race marriage. What makes this cartoon significant? It's an Archie cartoon. Times are changing, and justice will come. All right, one last thing. Do I can think we'll do this? I should have about, about yeah, about three minutes left. Thank you. Should be enough time. Um, it's part of one of our occasional features when we have just something. It's not terribly serious. It's called and another thing. In 1937, Amelia Earhart and her navigator Fred Noonan were flying over the Pacific Ocean. They were trying to fly around the world at the equator. The plane disappeared. For 73 years, there was really no idea what happened to it. Most people figured the plane ran out of fuel because they knew they were low on fuel and it crashed into the ocean. In June 2010, a group of investigators trying to find out what happened to Earhart and Noonan claimed to have found evidence that the pair might have landed on a remote uninhabited island called, let me get this right, Nicomaroro. It's also known as Gardner's Island. Well, now, according to a new study by the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, which has been released just in time for the 75th anniversary of Earhart's disappearance on July 2nd, Uh, Radio signals, which have been recorded in the first hours after Earhart's last in-flight message, which had previously been dismissed as bogus, some of them were in fact genuine, actual messages. If that's so, it would mean that the plane was on the ground, on its wheels, for at least a few days after it supposedly crashed into the Pacific. There's also been stuff found. Some, bo- I mean, clearly there was somebody cast away in that island. The question was who? They found bones. They found uh, 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 where fire pits had been. They found broken bottles and whatnot. They did find something that apparently was an anti-freckle cream. Uh, and Earhart had Earhart was freckled, and she was known to hate the idea. So that you know possibly been hers. And with these new things, they may have lived there for weeks, even months before dying as castaways on this remote island. So that's going to be it for me. For me, for me we're going to wrap up. Uh, we just want to remind you yet again about uh, June 16th, about the open house down here. Come on down here, find out how you can get involved. Uh, we are going to have some live programming, including me, if that doesn't keep you away. Um, but uh, come on down, find out how you can get involved, how you can do your own show. Um, how you can help out behind the scenes um, and hey, it's getting better all the time down here and uh, so we will see you on June 16th and I will see you next week you have the best week you can